Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On March 8th of 1965, U.S. Marines landed on beaches near Da Nang, South Vietnam as the first American combat troops to enter Vietnam. This would be the first landing of a long war. Later this year, Joe Namath would start his first game for the New York Jets. But we left off last week's episode with Patrick Gallivan telling us a story of Lloyd Wells being in the middle of a war for Otis Taylor, ultimately down the road leading to what we know as a merger. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is November 28th, 1964. We're here to witness the NFL draft, baby. Arguably... This was the most lopsided first round in NFL history because the Chicago Bears would be like stealing candy from a baby. The Bears had the third, fourth, and sixth overall pick of the draft. I mean, how does the league even let that happen? That's that's the first question I have. But besides the point, at the sixth pick, they took tackle Steve DeLong. The other two, well, let's just say they ended up as Hall of Famers. They took Dick Buckus at number three and Gail Sayers at number four. I mean, this is just crazy. But then at number 12, there was a guy that went by the name of Joe Namath. Namath? Wait wait a second. The NFL? I thought that we just got done saying that he played for the Jets. The Jets were part of the AFL in 1965. You see, that's where this gets interesting. Because the Jets took Joe Namath number one overall for the 1965 draft. In the AFL draft... Sayers will go number five, and Buckus will go number nine, so nothing matched. It was a war off the field just as much as it was on the field. And that's where we left off with last week's episode. I cut off Patrick when he was telling the story about Lloyd Wells trying to elude the NPP, the National Football League Protection Program. But first, before we get back in the episode, we had a book giveaway. The winner of the book giveaway is Jeremy McFarlane. And if that name sounds familiar to you, well, (laughs) it's because he has sent in many My Favorite Football Moments over to the show. And guess what? (laughs) This is kind of coincidence, I promise you. He has a new podcast that just recently launched. He's part of the Sports History Network. And again, like I said, (laughs) you're all like, oh, this is rigged. I I want to recall. I want to recount. Not to say to go with the time of the seasons, but I promise you this was not a rigged event. I use something called Raffle Press, and it's totally random, and he happened to be the one. And if I tell you what, I am so firmly on this. If you prove that I rigged this, I will say on air that I am the biggest Green Bay Packers fan alive, which if you're a regular listener of the show, you know that's a sacrilege in my family. So, not the case. Anyways, congratulations, Jeremy. The book will be on its way. And don't worry if you did not win the book, because you can still head over to the website to grab your copy of Patrick's book, which is Pro Football in the 1960s, the NFL, the AFL, and the Sports Coming of Age. You can do so by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com, which takes you over to my page on Sports History Network, your headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. 
Also, while you're at it, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show, but mash that little subscribe button your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest off the press episodes each and every week. But for now, let's get back into the story about Lloyd Wells and Otis Taylor. Let's go ahead and see what happened. This is with Patrick Gallivan. There's one big event that they talk about all the time. There's a man called Lloyd Wells who was hired by the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and he was a uh, real, he was a, he was a black man. And he was, had worked in the media at some time at, in his past, but he was a scout for the Chiefs. And he predominantly went to a lot of the historically black colleges and universities. That was his, um, his best territory because he would look for those type individuals that maybe were overlooked by most of the other teams in the American Football League and maybe other teams in the National Football League. And he knew Otis Taylor uh, for a long time, had been visiting Otis Taylor, who was a prospect in Texas, a uh, college player. Well, the Dallas representatives got him in a hotel room in the vicinity of Dallas and was hiding him out. So um, Lloyd Wells had to go and look and search and search. He made lots of calls to try to figure out where they had him because he figured Otis Taylor was one of my prospects. I expect to sign him. I've known him now for years. And finally, he found out where he was. He was at a Holiday Inn, I believe, in Arlington, Texas, one of the right up around uh, Dallas. He found out where he was. Uh, Lloyd Wells grabbed his camera. And he ran to, into the hotel room and he said, I'm with Jet Magazine. I just need to take some pictures of Otis Taylor for my for an upcoming magazine article that I'm <laughs> working on. And so he got entrance into the room and got to talk to him. And he said to Otis, you're going to get me fired if you don't uh, get away from these people. Because... <laughs> We had been talking for a long time, Otis, that I was going to take care of you. I was going to get you in uh, with the Chiefs. You were going to have a really good career with the Chiefs. Remember, I think there was a car involved, too, that Otis Taylor wanted a certain car. He said, I can get you one of those cars if you just leave with me. Of course, he couldn't go out the front door with them because the people were watching. But when um, Lloyd Wells distracted the, the babysitters, uh, Otis Taylor climbed out the window and away he went. And um, if you remember back in your history, Otis Taylor had a phenomenal Super Bowl four game against the Minnesota Vikings while playing for the Kansas City Chiefs. So that was one that um, kind of the espionage that you're talking about or sneaky stuff that was going on in the war between the two leagues. Yeah, and being that the war was going on, I mean, there were so many other leagues that took on the NFL, why do you think the AFL was really the only one that survived the fight? Well, they had a lot of things going for them. I think the timing was right. Um, this is the time of when uh, football was ready to explode. Um, it Football, in my mind, is a perfect sport for television. And television and football kind of grew together. And when the AFL owners decided to create this league, it was a perfect opportunity because there were lots of advancements in the television side of the world at the same time that um, football was ready to explode. So the timing was right. Plus, you had some well-financed individuals that were running the American Football League. These were some rich guys that were investing in this team. Some of the biggest names, um, Lamar Hunt is the son of H.L. Hunt, who was generally considered the richest man in America back in like the late 40s or early 50s. And so um, at, at one point after the first season, Lamar Hunt, it was reported that Lamar Hunt lost a million dollars in his first season with the AFL team. And um, they ran to H.L. Hunt and they said, what do you think about that? Your son's lost a million dollars. And that sounded like a big number for most people. But H.L. Hunt said, hmm, at that rate, he'll only be able to hold on for maybe another 150 years. <laughs> right, <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> so it's a different perspective. But I think that's one of the factors that they had was they were uh, determined to succeed and they had the money to succeed. We had an explosion of um, television. Television contracts got big, especially that second contract that the AFL signed was going to guarantee each team in the league close to $900,000. Yeah, 900000 I might get my digits mixed up. But enough money for them to go out and recruit a lot of talent. That big windfall was enough money for them to sign uh, Joe Namath. Um, the, the New York Jets, it, it basically funded uh, the signing of Joe Namath and other uh, college talent that came out in the mid-60s. Uh, you had other big contracts that were signed about the same time with Donnie Anderson and Jim Grabowski were signed by the Packers and uh, Tommy Nobis by the Falcons. And there was the explosion of salaries. That's what really put it to the head. That Those salaries going the way they were going just uh, took a, the leagues in a step towards merger because a lot of the owners said, this is enough. I, this is crazy. We can't afford to keep um, multiplying salaries and having them advance at such a great rate like they were doing. So um, that was the one step that kind of almost ended the war. He had him got to sit down for peace talks between the two leagues. But um, I think I touched briefly on the fact that TV exploding, TV changing, the broadcasting was getting better and better throughout the 60s with the invention of um, um, instant replay and other technology like that. Um, those, those advancements, I think, also helped the American Football League. I think it was perfect timing and well-financed organization of uh, owners. Yeah, different type of, I guess, businessmen that that's what they've done for so long and they have so much money versus a lot of the other NFL owners. And, so, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking to like George Hallis, for instance, like his business was the NFL. So did he treat it more like a team or did he treat it more like a, a big business? And I wonder if uh, you mentioned H.L. Hunt. He said, well, we can last 150 more years, but... By today's standards, Patrick Mahomes, I guess he could only keep him for maybe one more year. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole different world, isn't it? It's it's way different today than it was then. Some of the numbers look just um, – but, of course, the TV contract is even that much better than the one that was uh, negotiated that looked really good in the 60s. Um, the TV contracts today really dwarf it. Yeah. Oh, by far. And one of the questions I would have had for you too, and that kind of alludes to it is, of you know, what did the 60s do for today's NFL? And I mean, the TV, you brought it up, but that just alone dwarfs every other sport by far. I don't have the numbers in front of me to speak, you know, empirically, but it's just another reason why I believe that the NFL this year, 2020, was going to continue to go on, even if it meant there's no fans in the stands, just because of I mean, there's so much money involved with TV contracts. Yeah, they make so much money today on the television contract. Uh, back back at the beginning of the 60s and probably the 50s too, uh, it was a different world, different financial model where they really had to protect, protect that money of, from ticket sales because they made so much of their their uh, revenue based on those ticket sales. It's, it, it changed throughout the 60s when the TV contracts came in. But I think the biggest event that happened or the biggest thing that happened in the 60s that we can say thank you for today was the whole idea of sharing TV contracts and getting owners to think of the league as a whole instead of individually as what's best for my individual team. They started to look at what's best for the league as a whole. And uh, that's one of the things that Commissioner Pete Rosell is given credit for because he he had that whole concept of league think is what he called it and tried to get people to think um, in terms of the collective body, the whole league rather than just individuals. Because, for example, the biggest the biggest person he had to convince was the Maras that owned the New York Giants. When he came in with the idea of let's all share the TV revenue, 
New York, being in the media market that it is, could have negotiated their own individual deal and probably gotten a whole lot more money than smaller teams. Like if we look at today's NFL, like a Buffalo or a Jacksonville or a Green Bay, they it would be just night and day what New York City could could get uh, teams that were in New York or maybe some of the other big major major cities like uh, Los Angeles or Chicago, some of those bigger markets would be able to give more. But the thinking was, let's share the money because on a TV deal, it doesn't really matter. And we're seeing that today. I think I think we're going to see that today with the virus out. It doesn't really matter where the game is played, right? It doesn't matter who the home team is, who the away team is. In a TV game, it's one team against the other. It really doesn't matter as to, okay, so I'm the home team. I should make more of the TV contract than you as the visiting team. No, that doesn't. It takes both of us. It takes two teams competing against one another to make a game. But it really doesn't matter where the game is played or um, who's the home team or who's the away team or who's wearing the dark jerseys or who's wearing the light jerseys. It just takes two teams to compete. And so he was able to convince them better than I'm able to explain it, maybe. But he was able to convince them that uh, sharing the TV money was the key to attracting fans, generating interest, because it goes hand in hand with all the other things. You know, at this time of year, we all sit back, no matter what team you're rooting for, and you have a general sense of optimism that maybe my team, maybe this is the year my team will do pretty well. And I think Pete Rosell's getting the league think and getting to share the TV dollars went on to generate that kind of attitude that we all have at this time of year that we think, hey, maybe this is my the year for my team because everybody has kind of an equal footing at this point of the year. Now, sure, if you have a, a, a superstar quarterback, maybe you have a little better chance of winning the whole thing than if you have a rookie quarterback or somebody uh, really unproven in your starting lineup. But but I think that was the biggest thing that I see from the 60s was that whole mentality of um, sharing the revenues and sharing, keeping, keeping the whole concept that the league is more important than any individual team. Yeah, I think that plays a big factor too as far as the – the fans being able to be involved because there's more parody. I know we talked in the past about Burt Bell and how he would purposely put the not so good teams against the good team, you know, and, and they against each other and the good teams against each other. So you'd at least have some competition at the end. And I, I mean, I think about my personally, okay, when I was growing up and it's like, well, the Chicago bulls, they're just always winning the, the the NBA championship and you know I've always heard of the the Yankees and baseball and that and I really don't know how much they've actually won because I don't really follow sports but or baseball too much but I've I've there was a stat when another guy in my network was talking about the, the how many game or how many World Series the Yankees were in against the Dodgers like from year to year for the twenties and thirties and forties it was just like doesn't that get old after a while. Yeah, I'm not as big a baseball fan either, but if you go back and look at the 50s, it seemed like it was New York against New York, New York against New York every year, <laughs> whether it be the Yankees, the Giants, or uh, the Dodgers. Those teams seemed to rotate as to who was going to be in the World Series every year. And and to me, that gets old if you're in Detroit or St. Louis or somewhere else in the country you want right. to say, hey, when's my chance? When's, the, when's our turn? It's a tough one because obviously it's built on competition, but at the same time, as you said, it's the whole league speak and it's the league, the whole, everybody rises with the tide together and it makes the competition better. So then when you're watching the whole coined phrase, I've heard that it was Burt Bell coined it on any given Sunday, every team has a chance. And even my Detroit Lions, my lowly Lions, we still had a chance to beat the Packers, even though oftentimes it didn't work out that way. But still, we always had a chance. And this year, we still have a chance to win the Super Bowl, and I'm drinking that blue Kool-Aid. 
And see, I think that's you hit it on the head. Is uh, Bert Bell started that any given Sunday logic, and he tried to build in some things that he had, like with his schedule making and and different things that he he always looked at it from. Um, in my mind, from a loser's point of view, because his teams weren't that very weren't that good. He was when he owned a team. It was either the Steelers, who weren't very good in those days. Back at wait, so let's go back to the like the forties before they got really good, uh, or even the Eagles, who weren't that good back then either. Um, and so he had it from that perspective, and he wanted to make try to set the rules in such a way that any team could win on any given Sunday. And that's why he, he started that. And I think uh, Roselle took what he had started and carried it out and added more things and built on it so that we'd have that same strategy continue throughout the 60s and 70s and, and so on towards today. Yeah, I I can't really agree more as far as how he was one of them that started it. And I think that it was a big major factor. And who knows where it would have been, like you said. Maybe him having to have somebody else take over for him was best, but sometimes we don't. Maybe it would have been a different way. I, I don't know. And one thing that I think TV potentially could have done and still does today, whether it's better for the league or worse for the league, I don't have that answer is, I wonder how much loyalty to local teams that's disrupted, being able to watch any team you want with the NFL ticket, that is. You can watch any team you want, any game, as long as you have NFL ticket. And now you see a lot of fans that aren't, they're like displaced fans or they're they're Patriots fans because they they keep winning or Seahawks fans when they were the 12. And I'm a Lions fan through and through. I mean, everybody knows that now. (laughs) Yeah, it's it is one of the great things about living in today's uh, technology, um, because you can watch your team regardless of where you live. Uh, I happen to be I grew up in in Western New York. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, um, maybe by birth, so to speak. My dad was a a Bills fan, and I got turned on to the Bills early in life, and I've I've stuck with them. But I live in Texas now, so with with technology today you can really root for any team regardless of where you live. So I I think that's a great thing about living today is um, being able to have the technology that can make you almost feel like you're there, even if you aren't there. Yep. And another thing with technology today, which maybe this is what I was talking about at the beginning with Vince Lombardi and he, this is the part where I think maybe I could see him cringing is because most fans that are my age um, we are more loyal to the players that we, the jerseys that we buy, the fantasy, whoever's whoever's on my fantasy right. football team that year versus, you know, my team. Of course, for me personally, it's when I'm watching a game is Detroit Lions, then my one fantasy football league, then everything else. But, you know, because I got to got to beat my dad and my brother, of course, that's that's the number one rule. <laughs> but yeah. speaking of, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, Vince Lombardi had... Um, because of the era, because of the era that he lived in, he had a lot of stability with his team. Uh, if anybody left the Green Bay Packers, it was because he invited them to leave. If you if you know what I mean, it was my way or the highway. So, but when he took over that team, it was a real losing team. They had won one game before the year before he got there, and uh, he turned them into winners right off the bat. The first year, I believe they won seven seven games. Um, I'd have to go back and check, but it's he had a substantial increase in victories. Um, he really he won Coach of the Year with that first year because everybody looked at him as a, a one win type talent. Now they had a lot of good players that were there, and somehow he turned them in to better players with his appeal. His um, master, everybody calls him a master motivator. He was able to get the most out of every player they had on his team. And and some of the players he inherited that um, uh, Nitschke was already there. Um, Horning was already there. Bart Starr was already there. Jerry Kramer. A lot of these people that are in the Hall of Fame today were on the team when he got there. They hadn't been there very long, and they were fairly younger players. But he was able to redirect them and coach them up and motivate them so that they played their best. And he turned Green Bay into a winner when they they hadn't lost, or they had like 12 straight losing teams when he took over that team. 
Um, and then he did a similar thing when he joined the, the Washington team in the end of the 60s. They hadn't won in about another dozen years. Um, and he was able to turn them around and uh, and turn them into a winning team that first year. Of course, that's after that first year is when he got ill uh, and they discovered that he had cancer. So uh, he didn't get to see that one through. But that's another one of those stories that, uh, like you talk about, you can do your little what ifs and say, what would happen if he had survived? And how would Washington have done over the next few years? Because they did do well with uh, George Allen took over the team. Um, they did make it to Super Bowls um, in the early 70s. So he probably laid the foundation in that one year he was with that team, um, which other coaches were able to carry on after after he passed away. Yeah, and that kind of brings us back to the tail end of your book of, like we said, not the last chapter because you had to close it out, but the dream. And I just during all your research, was there, I mean, maybe impossible task to ask this question, but one one thing that stopped you in your tracks and you said, wow, I had no idea that this this is what happened. Yeah, well, there was there was a few stories that are, it's hard to pick one. Um, but one I thought was really, really, really interesting. Um, the ice ball game. If everybody remembers, the ice ball game was the um, – the game against the Green Bay Packers and the Dallas Cowboys uh, after the 1967 season, I believe it was. It was the winner of that game was going to go to the Super Bowl, um, the the second Super Bowl. And um, that in that game, if we if we remember, the day before the game, Dallas got there. And Dallas had lost in the last few seconds of the previous game, the previous championship game. Uh, they lost right at the end they had the ball down near the goal line and they were threatening to score and they could have won the championship with a touchdown um and it was intercepted in the end zone um and the and one of the very last plays of the game so it was kind of a heartbreaking ending for Dallas fans and team they the same two teams got to play again in the next championship game and the, the most of the Dallas Cowboy fans and the players said if we can just we got to go play in Green Bay so if we could just have some good, decent weather, I know it's Green Bay in the wintertime, doesn't have to be 70, but let's let it not be freezing or snowing or let's just have decent weather and we will win the game. They were all confident and they got there and did the walkthrough the day before the game and it was reasonable. It was like 40 degrees, I think, when they did the walkthrough. Um, or maybe very upper 30s, but still reasonable for the winter for a wintertime game. Um, but of course, the the cold weather came in overnight, and when the players woke up, they heard words like um, "Good morning." It's eight o'clock in Green Bay. The temperature outside is minus 13. The temperature had just plummeted and turned frigid cold. Now some of the players were thinking. Now, this game is not going to be played because they wouldn't make us play in this type of weather because the, the wind chill, because the wind was blowing too with the wind chill, it was close to like minus 45 with a wind chill. So it was ridiculously cold. Um, many people did expect the game to be postponed or not played because the conditions were so bad. But of course, as we all know, the game was played. Um, Green Bay came out early and scored two touchdowns, and it looked like, well, the home team must be used to this cold weather. They're just going to win the game. But then they fumbled a couple times, and the game got close again. It turned into 14-10. to 10. Um, Late in the game, on a halfback option play, uh, Dan Reeves threw the ball to Lance Renzel, and the Cowboys took the lead. And so in the second half of the game, the Green Bay Packers could not do anything. They could not mount any bit of offense. They had run like 30 plays and had minus nine yards of total offense or some some ridiculous number like that. No offense at all. So now they finally get the ball with about five minutes left in the game. And, um, and they're ready to mount that drive. Uh, Bart Starr brings the team out. You know, a lot of the teams deep down probably thought, this is ridiculous. We haven't done anything the second half. How do we think we're going to march like 60, 70 yards to 
down by four, can't kick a field goal. We got to score a touchdown to win this thing. Um, but it happened. They broke a couple short passes and a couple runs. And before you knew it, they were down on the right on the goal line. Now they they were in the shady end of the stadium. So that and that goal line was really slick, almost covered with ice instead of grass. And so the first down and second down, they had a couple runs and the runners slipped, couldn't get any traction. And uh, Bart Starr called his last time out, 16 seconds remaining in the game. Okay, it's the climactic ending. He runs to, it's third down now. So he runs to the, um, to the sidelines to confer with Lombardi. Now, of course, we don't know what he's there, but if we're watching the game on TV, we're probably hearing the announcers say, what do you think they're going to do? Well, most football fans would say it's third down. If they throw a pass into the end zone, it falls incomplete, they at least get one more chance. If they run the ball and they don't get in the end zone, it's probably the last play. So everybody in America probably thought they're going to throw it. They had two unsuccessful runs where the runner couldn't get any traction. Maybe Star will kind of uh, roll right or something, try to throw one of those little passes, dump it to the end or the tight, the tight end or the split end, and score the touchdown. That's what most people thought. Same thing was going on in the television booth. The television people were saying, okay, what should we do? And this is the part where I've, I had to tell this long story to get to your, answer your question, I guess. But the the cameraman and the uh, director was saying, the director was saying to the cameraman, I want you to focus on Boy Dollar, the, the end for the Packers, because I think he's going to catch the winning pass. I want to make sure I have a good shot of the touchdown that might win the game or if it gets deflected or whatever i can see the play because i think that's where it's going uh boy dollar was the leading receiver for the packers all season so it was probably a good bet if they were going to pass it was going to go there uh, well meanwhile star says he thinks he has enough traction if they just run what they called a 31 wedge which is really just a run right up the middle behind jerry kramer's block Usually it goes to the fullback, but he said to Lombardi, I think I can get better traction than the running backs can. I just want to carry it myself, and I'll lunge into the end zone behind Kramer. Lombardi says, go ahead, run it. Well, okay, back to the producer or the, the director. He's saying, okay, I want you to swing your camera out, look at do Dollar, because I want a good shot. The cameraman says, my camera's frozen. I can't move it. It won't budge. It won't go anywhere. All it is is honed in on the center of the line. He said, okay, just keep that shot. Then at least we'll see Star take the snap. Maybe we'll see him throw the pass at least. Well, of course, roll the film, go, go live. And what happens? Uh, Star lunges behind Jerry Kramer for the winning score. And we got a picture, perfect view of the game because the camera froze. If, it, if the weather conditions weren't so bad, we might have missed that play. And, of course, after the game, they showed Lombardi the play in the locker room even. And uh, he was all excited about Jerry Kramer's block. Of course, he's a former lineman, so he was really, way to go, Jerry, way to go, Jerry. <laughs> um, all excited about the, the winning score. Um, the the backstory to that is that, of course, was an instant replay. Jerry Kramer wrote a book, a, a diary of the Green Bay Packers season that year. And what did he call it? He called it instant replay. And so the interesting part of the story that I hadn't known before was that camera freezing, that it couldn't move. But then it all fit together with the other things about the, the book title and the fact that instant replay was fairly new in those days that we hadn't seen those that much because it was really just introduced a few years before. But that's, that's one of the stories. I, I could probably tell you a few more, but. Oh no. That's yeah. Great. That's, and we're going to leave that for the fans of the show to be able to read in your book for all the other ones, I think. And okay. who knows? I mean, that's just because of a camera freezing, possibly that's what, why Jerry Kramer's in the hall of fame. Because, it could, <laughs> you know, it could be because he, he received a lot of notoriety on that play. And now, of course, they slow it down and they show it again and they say, 
was he offsides? Right. It looks like he was moving a little bit, <laughs> a little bit before the snap. Now he says, "No, I was just fast off the ball. I didn't, I didn't move early." One of the but, most iconic moments in NFL history, and it's all because of a camera. And that camera guy, or I'm sorry, the producer guy is probably going, "Woof!" I'm glad that that one uh, froze yeah, on me. Got, got lucky on that one because that, yeah, that turned out really good for, well, for everybody. Turned out good for them, but it turned out that we got to see probably the best best view that we'd ever get to see of a really, really big play of the football history. Right, yeah. And speaking of football history and moments that that really define a league and an era, um, I'm going to go ahead and play the game that I like to play on every episode to give you the virtual keys to my DeLorean. You can go back in time, any point in NFL history, but I prefer it's before the time you were viewing football. What moment are you going to go to? Who are you going to talk to? Are we going to ask them? Wow. That's that's a tough call because I would probably have to ask you, how long can I keep the keys? Because there's a lot of stops I'd like to make. <laughs> because, you know, I, I could start at the – we talked about the 58 championship game and how critical that was. And then I think Super Bowl three was big because Joe Namath, one of the biggest upsets – in history, that was huge too. There was there was even a AFL double overtime championship game in 1962, which is similar to the 58 game. It, that was that would have been interesting to see too. Um, but you know, and this is going to sound a little bit like a Packers show, I guess. Because but the game I think I'd like to see to go back to, if I only could make one stop, is the 1960 NFL championship game. The Green Bay Packers played the Philadelphia Eagles, and it was the only playoff game that Lombardi lost. And I know Lombardi has a reputation of being a master motivator. So in short, I'd like to go back just to see what he would say. You know, if I could ask him a question, be why, if I and not get beat up, <laughs> right. I'd ask him what happened, why he lost the game. I might put it a little bit more delicately, but um, it's very similar to the ice bowl game. They were behind, and and Bart Starr led them on a on a on a drive down the field. They were running short of timeouts. Um, they completed a couple passes. They completed one pass where the receiver couldn't get out of bounds. They're now they're in Philadelphia territory. They're driving towards that winning score. And um, no more timeouts. The receiver's caught inbounds. Starr gets his team on the line of scrimmage, snaps the ball. All he sees is Jim Taylor open. He gives a uh, throw, a short pass over the middle to Jim Taylor, and Jim Taylor starts running. He knows in his mind that it could be the last game because the clock is ticking down. He probably hears the the clock ticking in his head as he's running towards the end zone. And in between um, him and the goal line is Charlie Bednarik, the huge linebacker of the Philadelphia Eagles. And Bednarik tackles Taylor about the eight or nine yard line. And he just lays on him. Wouldn't let him up. <laughs> you know, Taylor's trying to get up, struggling to get up so they could snap the ball, maybe get one more snap out. And then tick, 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 the clock goes the seconds go off the clock, and Bagneric looks down at Jim Taylor and he says, "You can get up now, Taylor. <laughs> Game is over." <laughs> and Packers lost. But I would like to go back to that game only to hear what Lombardi said. What did he tell his team? Because the reports were a couple things happened in the second half. Lombardi went for it on fourth down when he was down in. Philadelphia territory. And he had told the media after the game that this is my fault, not my players. Don't blame my players. This is my fault. I, when you get that deep in the opponent, opponent's territory, you got to come up away with points. We came away, twice we did that and we came away with no points. It's my fault. That's what he said to the media. And then um, supposedly, according to reports, he told his team, um, we'll never lose another championship game while I'm here. And of course, that's what happened. So if I could take the DeLorean and if I could sneak in their locker room, I'd like to hear what Lombardi told the team and hear it out of his words since he's a 
master motivator. I'd like to see what he said, because obviously he said the right things because they didn't lose another championship game. Yeah, I wouldn't mind being in the locker room for something like that, too. I'm, I'm both on after a loss like that, but then also to come back and then the victories thereafter, just to hear the old time coaches and compare it to some of the stuff I've heard in the past. And uh, I think this has covered a lot of football history. We've covered what it was like in the 60s, not just with football, but also in America. And I think that the fans I've only got a taste of what's going to be. I'm holding your book right now. It is called Pro Football in the 1960s, the NFL, the AFL, and the Sports Coming of Age by Patrick Gallivan. Is there anything else that you'd like the fans of the show to know about this book before they go out and purchase it? Well, I hope they go uh, buy it, and I hope they like it. It's um, I tried to put a lot of stories in it. To me, history is nothing if you don't have a lot of great stories. And I tried to put a lot of stories like some of the ones we talked about today, but a whole lot of stories like that in there that you may not have heard before. And if you're um, like, if you like football history, there's a lot of, a lot of good football in it because there were a lot of good games throughout the sixties and a lot of good football throughout the sixties um, and a lot of characters. And I think, um, Give the book a try. I think you'll enjoy it. Well, there you go. Buy the book. And speaking of the book, like I said, if you missed out on the giveaway, you can purchase your own copy over on the website. Again, I left links in the show notes and over at the website, thefootballhistorydude.com, which, of course, takes you over to my page on the Sports History Network. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the show and you're able to get some football gridiron knowledge nuggets about the 1960s and pro football. And keep on the lookout for next week when we dive into the rules with Ben Ostro from FootballZebras.com. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to TheFootballHistoryDude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes... Where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.